greetings. This will be our discussion on the disorders of the liver. So we'll be discussing your hepatitis followed by liver cirrhosis and then we will touch pancreatitis. So let's talk about hepatitis. When I say hepatitis, this refers to systemic viral infection. Okay, which involves inflammation and necrosis of the liver cells. So the term hepatitis, itis, refers to inflammation. Your hepatitis being a viral infection is considered to be self-remitting. So when I say self-remitting, it is able to resolve on its own, even without medications. However, the alarming part here is that continuous inflammation could lead to necrosis of the liver cells. Later on, we will see that one of the sequelae of your hepatitis is the development of your liver cirrhosis, which is the scarring of your liver tissues. Now, there are a lot of hepatitis. You have hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and other references would talk about hepatitis G. Okay, again, it's A, B, C, D, E, and G. Now, they usually vary on the route of spread. For example, hepatitis A and E are considered to be spread fecal oral route, meaning they usually spread by contaminated food. On the other hand, you have hepatitis B, C, and D. Your hepatitis B, C, and D are spread by blood. Whereas your hepatitis G, which is discussed by other references, is spread also by blood, okay, because it's also referred to as post-transfusion hepatitis. So they refer to cluster of clinical, biochemical, and cellular changes that occur in our body related to the inflammation of our liver. So why are we talking about clinical, biochemical, and cellular changes? Take note that the role of your liver okay, is on metabolism. It also talks about vitamin metabolism. It also talks about reproduction of your clotting factors. So a damage to our liver okay, would entail a lot of damage to other organs of our body. Now, high morbidity and prolonged loss of time from school and deployment is the usual consequence of your hepatitis. Then, at present, okay, the vaccines, especially your hepatitis A and B vaccines, has decreased the risk for or has decreased the incidence of these disorders. So, what are the different types? So, viral, as I have mentioned, the viral hepatitis okay, are the ones which are caused by your HEPA A, B, C, D, E, and G viruses. We also have your toxic or drug-induced hepatitis. Then you also have your chronic hepatitis. And then we also have our alcoholic hepatitis. So, um, your hepatitis G, other things about hepatitis G is that they are considered non-A to E hepatitis in humans, okay, which has an incubation period of about 14 to 145 days. That's why they say this is a different strain of hepatitis because it's different. It's way too long for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. As I have mentioned, hepatitis G is common among post-transfusion clients. We'll talk about the other types as we go on. So pathophysiology. The pathophysiology of hepatitis is common among all of the five A, B, C, D, E, G. So it starts with an acute phase wherein the patient will feel generalized vague symptoms. Sometimes the patient will feel weakness. Okay, that's it. Then your body will have an immune response to virus. Your body's immune response to the virus, which is populating your liver, will be damaging the hepatocytes. Okay, hepatocytes are the basic cells of our liver. With this damage to the hepatocytes, the liver will not be able to function properly in terms of metabolism, excretion of waste, production of waste products, or even the production of your clotting factors. Later on, this leads to necrosis. Now, the surviving cells will be able to retain glycogen, but the fatty changes do not occur. And other than that, the changes that occur in the liver interferes with the normal function. Okay? Breakdown of bilirubin could not be done properly. So what happens? Bilirubin leaks to the system. With that leakage of bilirubin in the system, jaundice occurs. Okay? Yellowish discoloration of the eyes occurs. Metabolism of drugs. Remember that we have what we call your hepatic first pass effect. With the liver breakdown, your liver will not be able to reduce the amount of medication that enters the body. There will be reduced metabolism of your medication. 
because of that reduced medication metabolism, the risk for toxicity increases. We are also having problems with synthesis of proteins, thus later on connecting to your fluid and electrolyte imbalances. On etiologic agent, look at the incubation periods. Okay, try to memorize this A, B, C, D, E, and G incubation periods. Okay, these are important for us to determine if the patient is really at risk of having hepatitis or this specific type of hepatitis after a certain period of exposure. So when I talk about incubation period, that is the difference between the time that the virus has already entered the body and the time that the patient will have manifestations, okay, or the time that the patient would have the disease itself. So imagine for hepatitis A or hepatitis B, hepatitis B would have one to six months. Okay, that's why if the client would really want to trace the source of his hepatitis B, okay, he needs to recall the sexual intercourse, intercourse I mean, for the past six months. Okay, and even the history of blood transfusion for the past six months. Because it is possible that the source of the infection may be those person whom he come in contact with still for the past six months. Then let's talk about transmission. So, you have your hepatitis A transmission. Your hepatitis A is from the RNA virus family, specifically your enterovirus family. Okay, so it's oral fecal. Other references would say it may be airborne. So, since it's oral fecal, meaning it could be from the contaminated food, it could be from the contaminated water that enters your oral cavity. So, contaminated food or liquid, it could be the shellfish from sewage, okay, contaminated waters, then sexual contact. Okay, as you might have noticed, I have mentioned earlier that your hepatitis A and E are orofecal route or fecal oral, oral route. On the other hand, your B, C, and D are blood, and usually, since it's blood, it would involve your sex already. But look at this one, hepatitis A. There's a mention here with sexual contact, and what we're talking about about here is your oral anal sex okay and then your anal intercourse with multiple partners which also increases the risk of your orofecal contamination so usually okay um, on deeper investigation for example in the community you would find out that there are haphazard sanitary habits okay they don't know for example how to prepare their food properly so the infected food handler can possibly spread the disease and then consuming water or shellfish again from your contaminated waters. Hepatitis B. So your hepatitis B is transmitted through blood. So percutaneous and mucosal routes for that matter. So blood, saliva, semen, vaginal secretions, your mucous membranes, and then your brakes. Okay? Mother to infant transmission is very likely. That's why if you can notice we're giving HEPA B vaccine to your babies, okay, to your newly born babies. Now, the transmission from the mother to infant does not usually occur in the placenta for the case of your hepatitis B. The transmission usually occurs okay, um, during the exposure of the child during childbirth, okay, and during the exposure of the child to the blood during delivery. Hepatitis C. So, your hepatitis C is also blood transfusion and sexual contact, okay? So, other than uh, the parenteral routes that was mentioned on HEPA B, okay, your HEPA B, C, D could also be transmitted through sharing of contaminated needles by intravenous injections. What do you mean by that? Okay, we, we are referring to here to drug addicts, okay, who use needles, who share needles with one another. So that's common for hepatitis B, C, and D, especially for first world countries like that of the U.S. Then you have your hepatitis D, your hepatitis D need to coexist with hepatitis B, meaning your hepatitis D could not exist without a prior or existing hepatitis B contamination or hepatitis B infection. Then you have your hepatitis E. Your hepatitis E is also fecooral route, okay, found in contaminated waters. Then you have your hepatitis G. Okay, your hepatitis G, as I have mentioned, is considered to be non-A, non-E hepatitis. Okay, there are references which say that your hepatitis G okay, is, uh, needs to have hepatitis C for it to occur. Okay, so there is a prerequisite of the presence of your hepatitis C for hepatitis G to be documented among your patients. 
signs and symptoms. When I talk about the signs and symptoms of your hepatitis, it can be divided into three. So you have your pre-ecteric, you have your ecteric, and then the post-ecteric were considered to be the convalescent phase. Now, on the pre-ecteric phase, this is the early stage of your hepatitis. In this stage, mild flu-like, URTI, upper respiratory tract infection symptoms would occur. Your patient would have low-grade fever. Okay, look at the signs and symptoms. Fatigue, muscle pain, myalgia, malay, arthralgia, joint pain, pruritus, which is your itchiness, photophobia, headache, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, altered sense of taste and smell, low-grade fever, and then liver and lymph node enlargement. So these are the pre-ecteric signs, okay? They're just vague. Usually, if your patient would manifest with anorexia, okay, which is more common in ecteric phase, this is caused by the toxin, okay, by the damaged liver or from the failure of the damaged liver to detoxify an abnormal product, okay? And uh, that leads to your jaundice and uh, dark urine. So as I mentioned, that will be more common in your ecteric phase. So your ecteric phase would usually last for one to two weeks, no? would have signs and symptoms of mild weight loss because your patient is having anorexia. And anorexia, again, as I have mentioned, is secondary to the increase of the toxins in the blood. Then you have your dark urine due to the inability of the liver to synthesize, metabolize your bilirubin instead of being excreted through the GI tract. Okay, your bilirubin okay, would travel to the bloodstream and later on would be excreted by your kidney. Then you have your yellow sclera and skin, and then you have continued hepatomegaly. Hepatomegaly is enlargement of your liver with tenderness. Then you have your convalescent phase. Your convalescent phase would last 2 to 12 weeks or longer, wherein the patient would manifest with fatigue, nausea, flatulence, indigestion, abdominal pain and tenderness, and some would report heartburn. So if you would look at this class, okay, looking at the signs and symptoms of any of those phases, your patient has a tendency to have imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. Okay, because of their easy fatigability, because of the GI discomfort that they are experiencing, the altered taste of smell, okay, all of those factors combined, we are expecting that our patient would have loss of appetite which is a usual problem among patients with hepatitis. Loss of appetite leading to malnutrition, imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. And then it will be followed by problems in macronutrient balance and your electrolyte balance, especially that of your protein. Now, children with hepatitis tends to be anecteric. What do you mean by anecteric? They do not appear yellow. So when I talk about children, if you suspect them to have hepatitis, okay, we do not really look for the jaundice sign like your adults. Okay? Then, irritability and drowsiness. If your patient is having irritability and drowsiness, you'd already suspect the appearance or the occurrence, I mean, of your hepatic encephalopathy. So when I say hepatic encephalopathy, meaning the toxins are already getting high, very high in such a way that it's already affecting your brain functioning. Okay, so do not think that this is just irritability and drowsiness because of being admitted in the hospital. Okay, always consider the presence of your hepatic encephalopathy because your hepatic encephalopathy is one complication that if ever recognized late, okay, will be very difficult to address. Then you have your anemia. Okay, anemia, of course, a decrease of your red blood cells. Okay, so symptoms tend to clear as soon as the jaundice reaches its peak. So usually it is uh, perhaps 10 days after its initial appearance. That's the usual case for hepatitis. So again, the symptoms tend to clear as soon as the jaundice reaches its peak. And the peak of your jaundice is usually 10 days after its initial appearance. Now, for the diagnostic test, okay, there are a lot of diagnostic tests that can be used for hepatitis A to E and G. Now, I would like you to focus on HBS-AG and anti-HBS, or sometimes referred to as anti-HBS-AG. Okay? Try to open up your medical surgical references and try to find out what is the difference between the two. And what would be the implication if my result for HBS-AG is reactive? And what will be the implication if my result for anti-HBS-AG is also reactive? Okay, what are the meaning of this? And then, try to find out also if what is the difference 
if I will be doing a quantitative and then a qualitative test for these two. Because for example, an anti-HPS, it's available in qualitative and quantitative examinations. So what is the relevance if I will be using your quantitative over your qualitative, knowing that the quantitative examination may be more expensive on the part of our patients? Okay, I know you've heard of this HBSAG and anti-HBSAG when you were processing your requirements for clinicals. So let's try to find out okay, in a lecture if what are the difference between these two. Then medical management. Okay, bed rest is recommended during the acute stage. We don't want to stress out the liver. Diet, increase in calories still because of recovery. Increase of carbohydrate to facilitate recovery. Moderate fats and protein is given. Okay, your protein is metabolized as ammonia. So be very careful okay, in such a way that if your patient is having hepatic encephalopathy, giving your protein is a no-no. Okay, because your protein converting to ammonia as a waste product would increase or aggravate your hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, alcoholic beverages is also a no-no. Okay, and then the FDA has also approved hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccine. So your vaccine class tends to be prophylaxis. Okay, vaccine, it prevents the occurrence of your hepatitis. But when it comes to treatment already, if your patient has already an uh, hepatitis, okay, immunoglobulins are administered in some cases. Then drugs. So as I mentioned, immunoglobulin for HAV. Okay, in this case, class, your immunoglobulin also acts as a PEP. Your PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. So meaning, I already know that I am at high risk of having HEPA A, for example, because I had a contact with a patient to have hepatitis A. So what will be the drug given? That will be your immunoglobulin. Okay, your immunoglobulin, remember, is passive immunity. So it's also used for uh, your post-exposure prophylaxis. And then other management tends to be symptomatic. So giving, for example, your anti-emetics, um, metoclopramide, antipruritic, okay, for example, to address pruritus, and then antihistamines to address some of the allergic-like reactions, and then vaccines, and then your emotional support. Okay, emotional support is usually needed by this patient, especially if the patient is on the etheric phase. Okay, they worried on how they look like, they worried that they might infect other people. So you need to be there for the patient. Okay, now, other than that, your patient has the capability or has the risk to be a carrier of your hepatitis virus. So on that aspect, if your patient becomes a carrier, they become a chronic okay, individual with a carries, who carries hepatitis viruses inside his or her body. So emotional support is also much needed by these patients. Okay, nursing management, good personal hygiene could not be overemphasized already. Okay, remember hepatitis A and E are spread through fecal oral route. Then you have your hand washing, especially after bowel movement, okay, fecal oral, then before eating. Environmental sanitation, so safe food and water supply, effective sewage disposal are all important for this patient. Okay. On the succeeding lecture, we'll discuss other types of your hepatitis, one of which is your toxic and drug-induced hepatitis. Thank you very much for your attention.